All right, today we are talking about customer acquisition. How do you acquire millions of customers at scale for your business? We got an expert. His name is Dan Engel. I'll tell you more to him in a second. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we feature top entrepreneurs, business leaders, and thought leaders, and ask them how they built key relationships to get where they are today. Now, let's get started with the show. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here. I'm the host of this show. You know, if you've listened to previous episodes, we've had some great guests. Every week we talk to smart CEOs, founders, and investors, entrepreneurs from all kinds of companies. We've had Netflix, Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard, Landing Tree, Open Table, and many more. And of course, this is part of our Santa Barbara series. We've been featuring a number of different investors and entrepreneurs from the Santa Barbara community, which I went to college at, beautiful community. We've had Paul Orfala, the founder of Kinko's, who came on, that became FedEx Office. Craig Cummings founded a number of unicorn businesses. John Greathouse, who I'm sure will come up in this episode because he introduced me to today's guest. And of course, this episode brought to you by Rise25, our company where we help B2B businesses get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Done For You Podcasts and our new platform, Podcast Copilot. Learn more at rise25.com. All right, Dan, um, pleasure to have you here today. As I mentioned, John Greathouse introduced us. Um, he's a, a mentor and a friend of yours who you worked with a number of years ago, um, and he was a great past guest on this podcast. And you are the managing partner and founder at Santa Barbara Venture Partners. It's an early growth VC firm, and you have an amazing array of experience in, in background, extensive experience in B2B and B2C software entrepreneurship. And really customer acquisition is kind of one of your uh, fortes. And you were involved in the uh, the growth of Picasa, which became Google Photos, was acquired by Google before Google went public. Also, you co-founded FastSpring in 2005, which is kind of like an early Stripe, a fintech SaaS firm which grow, tr grew tremendously. This is an incre incredible statistic from zero to over 100 million using about $30,000 in funding, which is absolutely bonkers. And um, a number of different stops along the way as well, including go to meeting, go to my, my PC. And, um, and now of course you are an investor and had a couple of exits in your young firm. But I love to start people with what they were like as a kid. You grew up in New York and you, were I imagine maybe shoveling snow, maybe lemonade stands in the summer. Um, what were you? What was your side hustle when you were a kid? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Uh, this is fun. Uh, well, let's see. I definitely shoveled snow. Uh, leaf raking was my big thing, and then uh, became uh, kind of the ice cream man in uh, high school. We had the ice good humor ice cream truck for a little while. That was really fun. Wait, we you had have... your own ice cream? Well, truck? we we kind of like. Uh, We'd go to a firm, they had a bunch of trucks, and then, you know, we'd get a percentage of the sales. Do you bring it to the school? Uh, yeah, we'd drive it around to different locations. And yeah, it was an interesting time. Sometimes there were ice cream man uh, turf wars. Uh, we didn't always win those, unfortunately. We were pretty young. <laughs> so I, I'd say half the time when I, I ask about this, I hear people say that they, you know, sold gum in school or weed or something like that, and they got busted by the principal. So I'm picturing you showing up with like an ice cream truck at school and the vice principal coming out and being like, what the heck are you doing, kid? Uh, it wasn't so much school we would do in the summer. Uh, so we would go to like beaches and people would get up off the beach and come get ice cream. Yeah. Um, so we had to, you know, some, sometimes we get kicked out by the vendors who were already there on scene, that kind of thing. So was there, uh, a, did you have an experience where you, you know, another ice cream truck was like, uh, Shaking you down, or what was that like? Uh, there was a guy down our street. Uh, when I say we, my brother and me, we had the truck, uh, and he got really, really angry, and he came over and yelled at us. And I learned years later there was actually a ice cream truck uh, a man uh, turf war that led to uh, someone being shot. Uh, wow. So you know, people are uh, possessive about their turf, even when it comes to ice cream. That sounds like either a podcast series or a Netflix documentary in the making. Like uh, that, someone needs to pick that one up. Um, and so became, now, before you became an entrepreneur, you actually um, thought you were going to be interested in investing, which you eventually came around to. Um, and you had a bunch of internships at Fidelity, and you met um, a man named Phil Carre, who um, Warren Buffett really credits as an amazing investor, and Peter Lynch, also a legendary investor. What kind of an impact was that, meeting those iconic investors early in your career? It was awesome. You know, I was like 19 years old. 
And I just wasn't afraid to ask anybody kind of anything. And so I would send out letters. That's what you did back then. And I would follow up by phone. I was persistent, still am. And uh, I was, you know, got myself into really neat places. And, uh, you know, there was a point in time that I was focused on trying to find a way to work with Warren Buffett. And I thought that going through his dad's broker, his dad was Howard Buffett, uh, which was Phil Correa, who kind of invented mutual funds and lived in the town next door, would be probably a good way to get an introduction. Um, so uh, that was part of how I decided to start spending some time with Phil and learn about what he invented, which is uh, value investing. Uh, people give a lot of credit to Ben Graham, but actually uh, uh, the first book on it uh, was a number of years before by Phil. Uh, when I met Phil, he was uh, 99 years old, and wow. uh, there was a lot of wisdom to be gleaned. Uh, he made it to uh, I think 102, 103, but, you know, he used to tell me things about, you know, what, what to buy in times of war and times of peace and, you know, how to, uh, how to think about things. And, and, uh, you know, our politics weren't always the same. He was always ranting about Roosevelt. Uh, but, uh, I learned a lot. You and, met him in uh, the late nineties. He still was rant, ranting about yes, Roosevelt in the late nineties. Yes. Yes. Like it's over, dude. Like son of a bitch, Roosevelt the, did that this. civilian yeah. conservation corps. Yeah. That damn WPA. Yeah, yeah. So you know, we didn't align on politics, but that's okay. And uh, maybe he saw a little bit of himself in me. I don't know, but we had a good time together, and we'd go out every once in a while for a lunch here and there. And you know, he'd tell me things like secret to living as long as he has was eating uh, meatloaf and mashed potatoes, uh, <laughs> which so, Buffett you know, and Munger kind of definitely person. copied that as well. Mm -hmm. These guys must be, uh, well, maybe we should listen to them about their diet because they're all in there. You know, Munger just died at 99 or something like that. And Buffett is yeah. 93 or 94. Yeah. Well, something tells me they uh, didn't help their odds with some of their eating and drinking habits. Uh, right. But, uh, you know, they're just small case studies. So in I read about this in 96. I think you created the first website for Sanford Bernstein, which was an investment firm. Um, yeah. which when you think about it now, considering cybersecurity and all that kind of stuff, it's a little bit crazy to think that you, I think you were 19 or 20 years old or something like that something when you did like this, that. but how did that come around? Um, you know, so I was really ambitious in high school and college of wanting to get really far in the investment world, um, and find all the key people that had a lot of the power and influence and, uh, get, find ways to work with them. And so, just like I did at Fidelity, where I ended up getting to work with the fund managers, uh, Ned Johnson, who was running the place, um, and uh, some of the, some of the other stars that were over there, Peter Lynch for a time. Um, I did the same kind of thing at Sanford Bernstein because they were considered one of the premier investment management companies um, and very, very well respected, especially for their quality of their research. And so I got an internship there uh, where I was supposed to, I don't know, I think I was supposed to just put uh, serial numbers on everybody's computer into some book log. Uh, but I was like, oh, this is an opportunity to meet all the investors when I go to their desk so, and, and get their computer serial numbers. So I would time it so that the people I wanted to meet, I would go get their serial numbers when they were physically in their, in their office. And then I would get to know them. We'd start talking about investing, not computer serial numbers. <laughs> and that's how I got to know a bunch of people there. And eventually they had me and the other intern they had that summer uh, do their website, um, which which was quite an experience doing HTML kind of manually back in around 96. And, and we created their their first site. They now are called Alliance Bernstein, uh, formerly Sanford Bernstein. Um, so it's a pretty big uh, investment company. And I, I was pleased to be able to, to spend time there and learn from some of the experts. Now, a couple of years later, um, you end up founding Grape Ape, which uh, I've read is described as an Amazon for magazine subscriptions. How did that idea come about? Well, the idea came through my dad, as a lot of my good ideas do <laughs> and uh, and have. Uh, and a lot of my success, uh, I attribute to, to my father's guidance. Um, he, in the 60s, during college, uh, had a list of magazines he was able to go around and sell, and it helped him pay for college. Um, and my brother and he and I, I don't remember the exact conversation, but somehow it occurred to us, wait a minute, we're paying we're paying like 20 cents to get a subscription for Sports Illustrated, which normally would cost 
that's quite a margin. And we were seeing what Amazon was doing. There was a company called CD Now that was selling a lot of music CDs. Nobody really was doing anything having to do with the other part of media, which was magazine subscriptions. And so uh, we went into that business and the idea was to do what Amazon was doing, but just not for books, but for magazines. And we did. Um, and, uh, you know, went through all the kind of craziness of the dot-com era, the highs and lows. And ultimately it turned out as wonderful sounding as it was, uh, people to this day and th even back then really don't subscribe, want to subscribe to magazine subscriptions through the internet. Obviously it's gotten to be a less popular thing, uh, now. Uh, and lots of problems in publishing. But even back then, it just turned out not to be a great category. Um, and, uh, you know, we kind of figured that out after the fact. None of the companies in the space, no matter how much they raised, uh, ended up really making it. Um, but we sure learned an awful lot. And that was my, you know, I did that out of college. And uh, it's I've crazy been using to, that experience ever since. It's crazy to think. I mean, you know, it's not that much of a leap for you to choose magazine subscriptions, right? Lots of people yeah. had magazine subscriptions back then. As you said, there's high high margin, you know, and yet that Incredible one margins. foundational decision, right, to choose yeah, magazines yeah. versus some other form of media has such a big impact on its it ultimate did. success. It did. And I think, you know, in retrospect, we should have done more of a market validation study. That's not something I would have heard of back in 1997, 98, but... Uh, uh, have very much seen since. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, the main issue is that there's all this confusion. If you, you subscribe to a magazine through an internet website with a newsstand, what is that going to mean for the thing that falls out of the magazine or what you're getting in the mail? There's kind of this conflict between different channels that you're communicating with the magazine in terms of your renewal or getting a new subscription. And I think people just weren't ever comfortable to any large degree. I mean, certainly there were some sales happening, but not it did not scale it did not become ever a good category uh amazon eventually wanted to get into it they looked at buying us they didn't end up doing that they did their own uh, and then they got rid of it i haven't looked for years but i would imagine if we went to amazon they might not have a section anymore that says magazine newsstand but they yeah, did for a well, while it worked out okay in two regards one is you met your wife through that and another is you ended up landing on your feet with idea lab so the, for those who don't know what idea lab is and you were an entrepreneur in residence. Yeah. What were those two things? Uh, well, uh, so Idea Lab was the first generation of what is now company uh, Y Combinator. That's pretty commonly known for incubating companies or building companies or seeding companies. Idea Lab was uh, equally super successful uh, at the time of its peak during the dot com era. Bill Gross, the CEO was as big as Bill Gates was to computing. Uh, he was on the cover of the Entrepreneur Magazines. Uh, he was the guy. So for me, it was quite an honor and a dream job to be asked to come in and build companies for Bill and for Idealab. Um, and my focus was in the wireless internet Bluetooth space. Now, unfortunately, it didn't last long, that dream job, as I've found to, I've found over time, I've learned, uh, sometimes dream jobs don't turn out quite as lovely as they seem. Uh, we went through the dot-com crash not far after I got there. So, you know, offices were shut down, layoffs and all that. So this is 2000, 2001 timeframe. Um, but uh, it was it was quite an honor to be able to build companies and try to IPO them. And that's what Idealab was great at doing. They did that with like, I don't know, eight different companies in a really short period of time. Uh, many of which became household brands. Some totally failed in the dot com crash. A few made it made it big and survived. Um, and and but, one of uh, them that was incubated there was Picasa, which became Google right. Photos, which you came back to a couple of years later. We'll get to that. Exactly. In, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Um, but first, before I get to that, I imagine there was some deliberate intention behind it. Like, how did you get to Idea Lab? Was there a person there that you sent one of your letters to that? You reached no. out to, or how how did okay. you get that opportunity at 24 years old to be an EIR at Idea Lab? Yeah, um, the way I got that opportunity was there was another incubator in Boston because this was the Boston Idea Lab office, and uh, it was called Reach Ventures. Then it became Reach Accelerator, Reach Incubator. You know, depending on how the trends were changing at the time. <laughs> yeah, and that thing totally collapsed, and we got laid off, and. I was at Wireless World 2000. Uh, I don't even remember where it was. Uh, Larry and Sergey were there. I remember that. And the guy who was the CEO of RIM was there. 
And uh, the guy from Idealab was there who was like the COO of Idealab Boston. And we started talking. And then he asked me if I would come over. Uh, and the timing was good since things were kind of ending at the other the other incubator. Um, and I had been at that other incubator in EIR and wireless. Uh, and so uh, now I was going to do the same thing. So I kind of set myself up to switch from a kind of no-name incubator to the premier one uh, that I wanted to be at. Uh, so that's how that happened. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now, it's just now, crazy I times. Now, after that, um, there's a, an up and coming company called GoToMeeting, Go to My PC, um, eventually acquired by Citrix um, in Santa Barbara. I think this is what first got you to Santa Barbara. So, how does that opportunity come around? Well, what got me to Santa Barbara, other than the palm trees and potential to live in paradise, uh, was the huge tech community here. Even though it's small, it's vibrant. Uh, Even back then. Even 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 back then, yeah, when the dot com era, I wouldn't say so much, you know, three years, you know, before the dot com era. So in your time yeah. when you graduated, not quite as much, but yeah, because I graduated in ninety eight, really... and they were just maybe I I also was an English major in college, so I probably wasn't as plugged into what was actually happening. Yeah, that that probably didn't help, but <laughs> being an English major, yeah, out in twenty minutes away at, at UCSB, but um, no, it really was more ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand one. Um, and, uh, so first I worked on a photo software venture, not Picasa, but a different one that we sold to Broderbund, uh, which was a big, uh, software company in the eighties that became owned by, uh, the learning company. Um, and then I worked with John Greathouse on go to my PC. Um, and we really hadn't gotten anywhere yet. Um, and it took us a while to figure it out, but eventually we did and it scaled big time to the tune of uh, spawning go to meeting and eventually going from scratch to, I believe at the peak, $800 million of uh, ARR uh, for that product line of Citrix Online, which after we sold it to Citrix, which John played a major role in, by the way. Yeah, I believe we talked about that in my interview with him. And, and you know, this really, you can't really understate the significance of that company because before go to my PC, you couldn't remotely access a computer that was somewhere else. I mean, this is before, way before the cloud even really took on, right? So it was a pretty revolutionary idea at the time. Well, what was different was that it was internet-based fully. It was web-based fully. There was this old product called PC Anywhere, uh, which was kind yes. of legacy old school. Yeah. And then Microsoft had something built in called like remote PC, PC, but like a lot of what was in Windows, nobody knew about it. Nobody was using it. So even right. though it was free, right. nobody knew about it. Uh, right. And it ha- it was technical. Everything was so technical. So we were trying to come up with something that was just for the everyday person that wanted to work on their computer when they're not at their computer, especially when they're at home and they're without smartphones and whatnot. There wasn't a way to do that. And so you'd go on your laptop and you'd pull up a web page and it would then show you your computer screen at the office, even though you're at your house. And that was challenging because uh, data speeds weren't that fast. So how would you see it and be able to move so quickly just as though you were in front of your computer at the faraway office? Well, we were able to do that. That was the the difficult technical challenge of it. So um, we talked about customer acquisition earlier. Do you recall in this time period one or two things that were really pivotal to acquiring customers to go to my PC at this at this period of yeah. time? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the big events that happened was, um, you know, my approach is kind of a spread approach to customer acquisition that I've learned over time, which is don't try to think you know what's going to work and what's not in marketing because so many of the things that should work don't and so many things that don't seem like they would work could. And you really trying to find what are those few channels of customer acquisition that totally work for your particular product, uh, your particular customers that hopefully also have the attribute of being very scalable. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can't find any, maybe you can find a lot of them. And so with GoToMyPC, we did a lot of internet advertising. We became the fourth largest advertiser after, I don't know, X1 wireless cameras, uh, Netflix, I forget who the other one was, and then us. We marketed the heck of this thing out, out, out online. And then I remember going to our uh, someone in marketing who ran part of the ad budget 
uh, and saying, you know, I think we should test out radio, TV, and some other offline traditional channels. And he said, well, you know, those are direct response. It's not going to work. And I said, yeah, I know you're right. You're right. But let's just try it. You never know. And we could just find a fit. we got to try things because we've been so surprised so many times. Uh, so eventually we got the okay and uh, it worked out. It didn't work out at first, but uh, we were able to make enough tweaks and figure out this offline world enough that we became a large advertiser on television, on radio, which sounded ridiculous for an internet company at that time. Um, but I'm really glad that we did try it out. Um, but yeah, so that certainly is an important uh, thing that was in terms of customer acquisition, uh, main uh, 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 transition period and something that was crucial to the success of that product line. Yeah. So just trying different things, being open to, you know, being proven wrong, I guess, and then trying traditional media uh, it was kind of the critical there. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. yeah. You end up going to Picasa, which had been incubated at Idea Lab. Um, yeah. What, what, how did you end up there? Well, um, you know, we we're having so much growth at uh, Go to Meeting, Go to My PC. We we're starting to flatline a little bit, and the guys at Idea Lab said, "You know, we're seeing these ads everywhere. You guys are crushing it. Can you show us how to do it?" And eventually, they lured me over. Uh, to do the same thing for them, uh, same kinds of things that I had been doing with with the uh, go to my PC, go to me products, um, and we were able to grow the revenue. I forget something like uh, seven times in ten months. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, incredible. Seven, yeah, uh, it, 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 that's, that's and was what it, it was. Was like. it the same thing? Was it traditional media advertising on TV? You know, it, Picasso. No? We didn't get there. You know, because mm -hmm. nine months or so after I started doing that, and we started getting uh, our name out there and becoming a more, more well-known brand, uh, we got acquired by Google. By Google. Uh, we were talking to AOL, to Apple, and Google, and Google got us. Um, and it actually is pretty important. I mean, you, Yahoo, uh, uh, Google Photos is a really important site. Humongous amount of users. It's very common. Absolutely. But to this had day, yeah. Apple done the deal with us instead, uh, that our product would have become effectively uh, iPhoto for Windows and could have potentially done for Apple what uh, iTunes did in terms of attracting non-Mac users. Mm. So I think it was a mistake on their part. And I remember Steve Jobs called uh, Sergey afterwards and tried to figure out, you know, what the plan was and all. But when we were talking to Apple, their attitude was, look, it's going to be us and Adobe and that's it. You guys are going to be dead. And that just, just didn't fit with our kind of culture. We were like just regular nice people and that whole. Because like, they were trying to bully you into. Yeah. 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 I'm mm -hmm. sure that works for them sometimes, but it yeah. wasn't our style. And we're like, these Google people are really cool. And we had done a partnership with them at, through Blogger. We were doing the photo stuff there. Um, and it just fit a lot better. With the Why do you think, you know, there was a very competitive space at that time. There were many other photo sharing sites in this time period. Why do you think Picasa succeeded? Oh, well, Picasa wasn't a photo sharing site. It really was a desktop application for organizing pictures, digital pictures. And then we had uh, just built uh, web albums, uh, web hosted uh, photos that we hadn't put out yet. And Google very much wanted that. They didn't care so much about the desktop photos, right? Because it's desktop. Right. Um, but uh, they needed a way to host photos. They wanted to be a, a main uh, resource. And I think the reason why they became so popular is because it was from Google and it was yeah. all kind of integrated. Yeah. By the way, an interesting story that not too many people know, but um, when, uh, when I got to Google and they put me in charge of all their customer acquisition for their main products, AdWords and AdSense, um, I noticed very quickly that they had no way to track the ads that I was buying to drive people to those products. I couldn't believe it. But That's incredible. You know, Google was a bit of a zoo in 2004. Yeah. Uh, this is pre-IPO. And they were very engineering focused and they kind of rolled their eyes at marketing. <laughs> it was an odd place. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, uh, they said, yeah, we don't really have a way to track our ads. Uh, what do you use? And I said, well, we're using this thing called Urchin over at Picasa, and it's really cool. And there's nothing like it. So we started using Urchin, and then they decided to acquire it. And that today is Google Analytics. Wow. Amazing. And, and what was that experience like for you? You you didn't last a long time, at least according to your LinkedIn here. It looks like it was maybe four to five months at Google. Yeah. What, what was it like for you 
uh, working uh, at Google? You know, it wasn't my kind of scene. You know, it's this big. Uh, you kind of drink the Kool Aid, lots of cubicles, Mountain View situation, and I was ready to do my next startup. I didn't want to be. You know, it was three thousand people at the time, and I just wasn't drinking the Kool Aid. You know, yeah. I. Uh, I want to do my own thing. Picasso was great. It was just 22 people and I wanted to do something else. And uh, so I, no, I didn't stick around too long. Uh, we had the IPO. There were a lot of really cool experiences there. Um, and it was a neat place to get to be and spend some time. Also, I was living in Santa Barbara. Uh, my wife did, got were you commuting? PhD. So I did, I, what's that? Were you commuting to Mountain View then? Not really. I mean, I'd go like every couple of weeks and mm -hmm. I had to keep secret that I was here. Because mm. they had other people here and they made them all go. But I said, you know, my wife's getting her PhD. I can't go up to Mountain View. I mean, I didn't want to. But, yeah. uh, you know, they, they, I like it better here. And uh, I like our tech scene here. And I just don't want to be part of that sort of Silicon Valley rat race. It, it's yeah. not really my style. Um, but, uh, but also, you know, part of it was also that Google didn't care much about advertising and the kind of stuff that I had done for these mm. other companies. Because their attitude was, you know, if there's a billboard outside on the road that's Yahoo's on, we're not, we don't care. And I, my attitude was, well, it's users we could be getting. And at the time, you know, what just wasn't that obvious where Google was headed. Everything was concentrated just in search and their traffic and their website for searching. And everything else they were trying was failing. And I mm -hmm. just thought they should have had a little bit more attitude toward I know what, what we're doing has gotten us here, but maybe what we're doing and sticking only to it in our ways was maybe not the best strategy uh, indefinitely uh, for uh, diversifying the company over time. And it turned out they picked something in search that has lasted all this time. And usually that's not how it works. You, you know, you right. got to diversify your risk a bit, but they, they nailed it. Well, um, as, we record this, as we record this in, you know, in March of 2024, questionable right now we have chat gbt and these ais coming in that we'll see what happens with that's that right. well it's if been a long time continues it has it's been 20 a years long time but and they did find some successes you know gmail became popular android became popular but if mm. you remember so many things they were doing whether it was frugal or orchid or social yeah. network just one failure someone after another. i know there's a website somewhere someone shared it with me recently with all the different google starts and stops the <laughs> different businesses mm -hmm. they've launched and, and products yeah. they've they and, and God bless them for trying, you know, yeah, Google. Sure. Lab, I mean, we, just like with customer, you got to try stuff. Right. But uh, luckily, the main thing, the only thing that was successful for them for so long turned out to be the best thing it could be. And unlike Lycos and Alta Vista and all the others, theirs actually lasted. True. You know? So uh, Grape Ape had ended about 99. And here you are after the success of Picasso being acquired by Google and then Google going public and you're itching to start something new. And you started a couple of, from this point forward in your career, you, you're involved in a lot of different things. But one of the things you started was Fast Spring. And I'm curious, you know, you developed an expertise in customer acquisition. And um, in order to get to the point with Fast Spring that you were doing customer acquisition, you had to build something really hard. You had to build something that was kind of like modern day Stripe uh, financial infrastructure, which is yeah. no easy feat. So what was the early days of Fast Spring like? Slow spring, slow that's what spring. My wife would call it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh God, it took years. You know, we thought like a lot of entrepreneurs. Oh yeah, in six months we'll have a product we can sell. We kept going to customers, and they would say, "Okay, you've got A, B, C, and D now, but you're missing E, F, and G." And we just kept having to add things to lure them away from existing legacy. Uh, Which was what? What we were had. they using? Digital at the time. River. Digital, Digital River. I don't even remember that. I don't remember. Oh yeah, they're a '94 company from 1994. They were a publicly traded billion dollar company, uh, and basically we were trying to take away their business to the largest extent possible by being everything they weren't. So their customer service stunk, their pricing was too high, and their technology was for you know dinosaurs. So we used next generation technology, far lower pricing, and phenomenal customer service. But if we didn't have enough of the features, we couldn't get the people to switch. So it took a long time. And ultimately, really, we didn't do that well in the Windows environment, but we found eventually uh, an area where we did very stand, much stand out, which is Mac software developers, independent developers on Mac. On Mac. And this kind of came guys, from a couple of key relationships, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the first one uh, was uh, a guy's name was Lauren that uh, was running a, an, an app called Tweety. 
And it was kind of the way that people use mobile phones to go on Twitter. There were some others, I think maybe TweetDeck or something, a few others, but his was the main way. And Before about, Twitter had an app of its own. That's right. They didn't have an app. So yeah. you had to go on the desktop yeah. unless you use Tweety. Which actually um, seems crazy today in the world yeah. we live in today that that didn't exist. Hard, hard to believe. Um, but, you know, mobile is you know, prevalent now, but it wasn't yeah. nearly as prevalent at the time. Um, if you remember things like Uber or Lyft, those all were just Facebook apps. Yep. There weren't phone apps. Luckily, yeah. they transitioned. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and so um, uh, Lauren started blogging about his experience with us and how much better it was than I believe Digital River, who I'd used before. And so many Mac developers looked up to him. Um, and he ended up selling Tweety to Twitter, and it became Twitter for mobile, hmm. for iOS and Android. So uh, that really helped us to get credibility and get known in the Mac community. And then we started developing features for the Mac community specific to them that those legacy providers wouldn't do. Uh, and then they're like, hey, these are the Mac guys. And it wasn't an easy group of people. You know, these are the, these are the Mac service providers that people are starting to use. And it wasn't easy accommodating that group of folks. I mean, they're pretty darn demanding. You got to be pretty good. Yeah. And, yeah. and luckily, we had such a strong team that we had four co-founders uh, that had all built companies. Actually, not me. The other three had all built companies that competed with Digital River. And then they got acquired by Digital River. Uh, so we all knew very much this business and had been CEOs individually. Uh, so and we they weren't all in Santa Barbara, right? That's right. Actually, um, we were completely remote. Uh, we started the business in 2005 um, and we always were completely remote. I think uh, for a long time, there was never two people even in the same office. And the co-founders and I, the three, the four of us together with me, uh, went a period of about three years without ever seeing each other. Why is uh, that? Well, we, one lived in North Carolina, one lived in mm. Georgia, one lived in uh, Seattle, um, and then I was in mostly in Santa Barbara. Yeah. Um, and there wasn't any reason to get together uh, or need. And we just did everything by email, texting, or whatever you know. I am, and uh, and yeah. every once in a while we'd have a phone call, <laughs> uh, but uh, it worked. You know, some of them were very technical people; they just didn't love talking on the phone, just like a lot of software people are. Um, yeah. But it, it totally worked. And, uh, you know, the biggest issue or fight we ever had was uh, picking the name in the beginning. It was really hard. And I thought, oh, my God, this is going to be quite an experience these next years. And it turned out it was it was all kind of uphill from there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we worked really well together and probably partly because we were separate from each other. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about alone. that. I was going to ask about that. I mean, usually when you have a bunch of individuals that have been CEOs of separate companies and they come together then there can be turf wars. It might not work out well. Why do you think it worked out with all you guys having previously had experience as CEOs? Well, because we left each other alone to kind of run our independent areas of the business. So the product guy did that. I was on the sales side and the CEO dealing with all those roles. Uh, then we had one person who dealt with all the customers in terms of customer support, customer success, and then another partner who uh, eventually got very involved on the on the sales side, but also worked on partnerships. And like I said, we all had been CEOs, so we didn't need nobody needed to manage these people. The four of us, um, and then the people we hired, most of them were people that we had worked with in our past companies, uh, and uh, we didn't ever lose anybody. And a part of it was. I'm sure because we picked great people, but another big part was they couldn't find alternative jobs that would let them work from home, wherever they happen to be. I remember we had one woman who wanted to take care of her child as needed in Maine. Like, where mm. would she find another technology job like that in the middle of Maine? She wasn't even in a yeah. big city, um, but she knew someone who had worked with us. And so through that sort of, you know connections uh transitive property there we we kind of knew the people we were hiring because they we all had worked together through other people in fact that's how I, the four of us came together as founders i knew one of the founders he had worked with the other and the other had worked with the other so that's kind of how we did now obviously it doesn't scale when you get a big company but we got to a place where we were scaling really scaling and uh, on the revenue side but we didn't need to add any more people um, and that was a great place to be. You know, we kind of had the bases covered. And so we started whipping out some really great profits in that business. Mm. Um, and and it, you only raised or you only invested $30,000. Yeah, so, I gave 10 grand. 
Mm -hmm. And two of the other guys gave 10 grand. And then the one who was building the product, we didn't ask him to put any money in because he was initially putting in more time than us Mm. because he had to build the product while the rest of us are somewhat waiting for the product to be good enough to sell. And there probably was a point where that guy, after he'd built it, was uh, not as in demand, I imagine. Or were there other things for him to do at that point? By that point? Uh, No, he was always very much needed on the product side. Yeah, he was probably the busiest of all of us (laughs) and the most essential um and he had i think the second largest equity stake and by the way the way we built the business is is a way that really mattered which was that we kind of built it not to be able to fail what i mean by that is we didn't bring on expenses we didn't raise money we bootstrapped it uh and so the only way we could possibly fail was really to lose interest Mm. if we couldn't get far enough soon enough maybe one or more of us would just say oh i'm gonna go work on something else but aside from that, how would we fail? It was just a question of how long does it take us to get clients yeah. and how many can we get? And we knew if we kept at it, we eventually probably would get enough traction. Uh, and we did, but it took three and a half years. Yeah. Um, but there wasn't any you know, clock running. There wasn't any you know, burn problem. Uh, Is it, it because you each time. had kind of exited other businesses? So you had a little money in the bank or did you all have we, like kind of side all, hustles that were helping to keep the lights on? Or, it or was help, really help a combination. It yeah. really combination okay. depended on who it was um, out of the four of us, but we did it all for equity mm. and uh, and that 10 grand each. Um, and uh, in the end, it was sold for over a hundred million dollars uh, uh, to uh, Excel KKR. By the way, and, for you uh, personally, you know, you had worked in photos, you'd worked in magazines that didn't work out. You'd worked in remote software yeah. Why fintech? What what drew you to the financial underpinnings of the infra- of the internet? Um, I guess what happened was that so I had a lot of experience with this world of Digital River and software payments and small software companies because one of the ventures I worked on was a product called Morpheus. Uh, and Morpheus, uh, it wasn't the P two P file sharing app. It was Morpheus for like morphing and distorting images. Mm -hmm. Um, And in building that with my partner, who was the technical side, I was the business side, we built a whole backend infrastructure to basically do everything I wanted to do in terms of managing the business, in terms of marketing the business, tracking, you name it, all that functionality he built the system for. And so I went through that whole experience and I kind of thought, well, this could be useful to offer to other software companies if we could. And I had this idea for kind of a cross-selling merchandising capability if we could get into the shopping cart of other software companies. And I went to Jason Foodman, who was the CEO of Swift CD, which was, you ever bought a, a software in the 90s uh, and it asked you, hey, would you like to receive it in the mail as a, on a backup CD? That was Jason. He pretty much had the whole market. Um, and uh, so I partnered with him uh, with this business. Cause I said, could we do this merchandising idea? He said, awesome idea. I think it would totally work. Cause like 40, 50% of people who go through a shopping cart, take some sort of upsell or cross sell. Mm-hmm. Um, so we could sort of pipe in cross sells and upsells of other software companies that we work with and get a piece of it and it would scale. Um, and the customers are already sitting there. Uh, and he said, but I don't think we're going to be able to get any of the big shopping cart companies like digital river, the, the big gorilla uh to allow us to integrate in so we'd have to build our own and so then we said all right what do we look at building our own he said well it just so happens i'm working with this other guy i think his name was steve on building a competitor to digital river and so i said oh well maybe there's something there and he said yeah let me see there's this other guy i was thinking of getting involved and he called him and then that guy said he was interested that was ken and then we said we put our brains together all right who the heck can build this and ken said the best guy probably in the planet to build it is the guy that built Reg now and sold it to Digital River. And he was the guy behind the uh, affiliate links on download.com on CNET, which was where a lot of activity was happening in the software world back in the 90s. Uh, download.com was kind of where it was at. And he was working at Starbucks at the time, just kind of taking a break. And we all came together and said, hey, Ryan, what do you think? And uh, would you be interested? And he said, yeah, I'll give it a shot as long as I can do it in Java. And we said, I don't know, but all right. 
if that's what we need to, 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 to sacrifice, we'll do it. And he did it and he did it in Java, which was great in some ways and challenging or slower in others at times. Uh, and, uh, that, that's kind of the story of, of how I got into it. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what got our team together. And then um, you end up exiting that business. How, by the way, how did the sale come about? Were you done? You wanted wanted to sell it? Did you, oh. were you proactive about finding a buyer? Uh, you know, people are like, oh, don't you regret selling it? Because now, you know, when we sold it the first time, we sold it twice, um, which most entrepreneurs, unfortunately, don't get more than one bite at the apple. You know, they, you sell your company. If you sell it to like private equity, they let you or they want you or require you, st you keep maybe 20% of your equity and roll it over. Uh, but usually it doesn't work out so great. In our case, actually, the second bite of the apple was became worth more than the first bite. We yeah. were very fortunate. Um, but uh, um, we had, we were concerned that there were too many risks in the business with doing payments for this kind of uh, group, which was software vendors, because we kept just having issues with Visa and MasterCard, and we'd get letters about things uh, that were, you know, oh, we'd get fines, and they started getting really big for things we couldn't control, like somehow someone had gamed our system and put through orders of things that were, you know, against the policies of MasterCard, and we'd figure out a way to avoid that next time, but then someone else, you know, how hacking is, yeah. you know, they yeah. figure out the next hack. So, we were scared um, that we could lose the whole thing. Mm. And uh, so we started looking at options. And first we started looking at raising money. And then we said, all right, well, maybe we should look at M&A and test the market. And we got to a place where the pricing we could get potentially out there um, was enough to satisfy us when you split it out amongst the four of us. And so we hired bankers and we went through the process. And it we ended up having two deals fall through. And then the third one worked out. And that was over a year and a half period, which was not always fun. You know, it's a lot of work yeah. to try to sell your company. And, uh, you know, a couple of times it pit us founders against each other because we didn't all four agree always that the right amount was the right amount for each. You know, it's like one person's OK with this and others not. Right. One wants to sell here. So uh, we had a couple of uh, scuffles on that one. That was probably our second area in eight years we had some real disagreements. So that um, acquisition, the first acquisition was in 2013, and then the second was in 2018. Um, did you stick around for the second acquisition or did you had you moved on um, by that point? I stayed for like a year. I was on the board for like another year. And um, the guys who took over, they wanted to take over as CEO and do things a very different way. Turned it into like a private equity attracting business. Um, add lots of layers and infrastructure. It just wasn't our style. We were lean yeah. and mean. We did an awful lot with very little. They were, you know, taking people that we had and replacing them with seven people and creating huge departments. And it was not our style, um, but it worked. It worked uh, because uh, they got rid of all the profit. They just started spending a lot of money. We're like, oh, where's our profit going? What are you doing? <laughs> but, you know, we uh, when we sold it, we were doing maybe... I don't know, 8 million in net revenue or something. And they got it up to, I don't know, 35 million. Now it's maybe 75 or something like that. There's like 150 people. We sold it. We had 22 people and only 12 of them were full timers. Wow. Uh, we were doing over 100 million in revenue. So that's uh, insane. In, in, in gross. Um, yeah. So um, very different styles. Um, but uh, yeah, the reason we sold, I think, is we were nervous and it also had gotten to be worth enough for us to walk away with enough millions that uh, we'd be satisfied. Um, and uh, also there were other threats like um, Apple came out with the Mac App Store. And that was really scary because we thought maybe all the Mac software is going to only be purchased through the Mac App Store on, on Mac uh, desktops, uh, Mac computers. And uh, it turned out, no. People still were buying outside of that store, but yeah. you know, but things like that There's happen. A lot that like, goes oh through God. it. I mean, that's that's a yeah. big issue with Spotify these days. It's really uh, been fighting Apple on that because they're yeah. take a chunk of their revenue. Yeah, 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 and that would have cut us out totally. You know, so you know, people look at people that make a lot of money as entrepreneurs. Oh wow, they're you know they did so well, and why didn't I get all that money when I joined later in the company? But look at what an entrepreneur goes through. Yeah. Right. So many uh, times this whole so thing stressful. you build for years and years and all the stress and the struggle. And by the way, when you're building it and you're struggling, you don't know if it's ever going to work. Mm -hmm. You know, you're questioning it. Other people are questioning you. Like I said, my wife called it slow spring. She wasn't happy about how it's going. <laughs> so I kept saying, you know, success is around the corner and it kept getting put off. Uh, 
But, you know, you're going through all those things that can totally jeopardize the whole business. So you kind of earn it. You know, you kind of earn the kind of pay that you get when you have a payday because it's so hard to generate that payday. For sure. Um, and yeah, what you go sure. through to get there uh, with risk and, and struggle. What, what point did you decide that, you know, it was time for you to move on, time for you to do something new? Um, what was, was there any triggering point that, that yeah. made you? I think we felt like the business uh, was at risk of uh, not working out after it had already been so successful. There were just some really uh, big uh, issues that we were dealing with that we felt could reduce all of the value of the business essentially overnight. And uh, those fears That's drove scary. us. <laughs> That'll keep you up at night, that kind yeah, of Yeah, well, you know, a lot of businesses have those kind of risks. They try not to think about them. But, uh, you know, if you're dependent on somebody else for something, like say you're tied into Amazon for your service or yep. Google, like all your traffic comes from yep. Free free traffic from Google, and they make a change to their algorithm, and all of a sudden you lose ninety percent. So that what stuff were happens those things a lot. For, what were those things, if you can say, for FastSpring that you were that were um, keeping you up at night? There that? were a few. Uh, one was that uh, every so often someone would get through all of our safeguards, and we would do transactions that were unauthorized uh, because uh, somebody would trick us and a vendor merchant mm. uh and then we would close up that uh, hole and of course like any good hacker they would find yeah. another one or figure out some other way to trick our system and uh when we had those violations we would get very outsized uh fines from visa mastercard um mm. that didn't really go with you know i remember one time we we had like maybe 400 dollars worth of uh transactions that were were definitely violations. Yeah. Uh, and we got a, a fine for like 200 something thousand dollars. Wow. So, yeah. So you can That's imagine. Insane. How, yeah. Yeah. And what I do mean, you do? At when this point, you're a much larger business, but if you had been a smaller business, that could have crushed you. Yep. That's right. And what would the next fine have said? Could have yeah. been, here you go. Uh, you now owe uh, 2 million or 20 yeah. million. And there's nothing we could do about it. What are you going to do? Sue MasterCard <laughs> or Visa? So it's, uh, we it, it basically you, they hold the cards, and there's yes. nothing you can do with those with with those couple of players in the marketplace, Master yeah. and Mastercard and Visa. Yeah, yeah, that was part of it. Also, we uh, uh, we kind of ran in this gray area that had existed for a while, but was always at threat on and off, which was that we we're processing for others. Uh, but the way we did that was we took flash title, it's called. Uh, so we became an instant uh, on the fly reseller of every software product that we sold through our platform, through our own merchant account. Um, and that's only really allowed in a few industries. One of them is in software uh, because you're really, in, even though it's someone else's software product that you're selling, you're in full control of the fulfillment of the product. And thus you're in a lot of control of whether there's refunds and cancellations and chargebacks. Um, so because of that, uh, those in that industry are able to kind of uh, skate by for a while, uh, processing transactions for their vendors by sort of taking on a temporary reseller role in each transaction. Um, but it's it's a gray area, and sometimes uh, there were threats to it. Um, and then also the uh, um, Mac App Store had come out, and that was a threat as well, because if everyone started buying, say, their Mac software just from Apple uh, through Apple's store for third-party software, uh, all of a sudden there's no place for us to sell through websites anymore. So those are examples of just three things that have come could have completely uh, ruined our business. And, uh, you know, we wanted to sleep well at night and a lot of our net worths were tied up. We had four co-founders in this business that we had built that already had been successful after not having been for the first few years as we struggled to make it successful. Um, we didn't want to lose that. So uh, we were very interested in looking for the opportunity to perhaps sell the business for a price that would generate enough cash to the co-founders that it would be worth selling and removing that risk versus continuing. Now, if we had held on, you know, in retrospect, none of those risks came to fruition of ruining the business. Uh, we would have made a, 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 a quite a fortune <laughs> just from the profits growing mm -hmm. uh, as that business, you know, we sold it, it was doing 
maybe eight million in revenue, and lots of that was profit, millions in in bottom line profit. Uh, the way we ran things, mm. uh, but that eight million became what's now you know something a little less than a hundred million. Uh, so you can imagine uh, what kind of profit distribution yeah. there would be at this point. But you know, you look back on it, and uh, I, I, there's not a day that goes by that I don't benefit from that decision, even though it could have been more financially beneficial later. Uh, every day I benefit from the freedom that that t- transaction produced and the other benefits of it. So I don't regret it yeah. in the least, uh, even though, the, you know, the math might've worked out better if, if I had held on and known that in the moment, yeah. which of course I never knew when, and we'll, when the we'll, bottom would fall out. And we'll get into your present day as an investor, but if, does, do you think that going through that experience and realizing that the company survived, that those, your worst fears didn't come to fruition, does that give you a stronger appetite for risk where now in, when you're advising founders or portfolio companies that you're you know, encouraging them to, to keep going and to, to not sell because, because these, you know, your greatest fears didn't come to fruition previously? No. No, no. <laughs> not at all. Not I'm at all. still totally nope. fearful. <laughs> well, look, we're in the risk business. You yeah. know, people people look at the situation as a venture capitalist or startup founder and say, oh, wow, you're so good with, with taking risks. You're willing to take risks. We're not. And actually, no, what we hope we're good at is uh, managing risk and avoiding and eliminating risk. Mm. Uh, that's really, the, you know, the decision may ha- decision making and where risk fits into it. You know, how can I make an investment as a venture capitalist with the greatest upside and the least potential risk? So no, I'm not comfortable with major risks. Uh, I'm trying to avoid and eliminate them yeah. uh, whenever possible. Um, so, uh, you know, if a founder, if I'm an investor in a company and the founder has the kind of risks we had at Fast Spring. I would very much uh, be looking at uh, what kind of options there are at the same time that I'm continuing to try to reduce those risks um, yeah. if they're that systemic. Interesting. Um, so first of all, what was the process like for selling the company? Was it a, you know, reach out to a zillion different, um, you know, private equity companies? Was it, uh, did you have a, a or did a, a did a, a you know, buyer start materializing because they were already interested? What was the selling the process like? Um. You know, in the old days, the way to sell your company, well, in software, it was, you know, sell to Microsoft. Uh, and in other businesses, it was sell to some competitor or sell to some corporation. And there was a very small number of them. And to get all everything to align at the right time was quite difficult. These days, there's quite a universe of potential buyers. You know, you've got private equity, you've got search funds. We actually sold the first time to a search fund. You've got so many different vehicles that are out there with cash trying to buy your company for all sorts of different reasons that don't have anything to do with whether you strategically fit in with them as a uh, corporation that's trying to expand their existing business. There's companies that just do roll-ups. So what's wonderful is we have the opportunity to go out to, uh, in the beginning, I don't know, 40 or 50 companies. Um, But ultimately, because we had two deals fall through before we had an acquisition close, Ultimately, we went to about 150 firms and we didn't do it ourselves. We did it with investment bankers. And unlike us, they had all these relationships and they certainly know who the buyers are. And I can tell you for sure, the ultimate buyer, the third time around, uh, we would not have known about had we not hired bankers because it was a search fund. And most likely like you, I had never heard of uh, what that is. Um, nor would I have had a relationship there. And that's who ended up being the best fit for us. Which is um, where a, a company is is basically organized for the purpose of acquiring a company and running it, right? A search fund? Yeah, it's yeah. MBA students that raise money. Sometimes it's undergrads, mm-hmm. uh, one or two people uh, that raise money to try to find a company to acquire. And then they try to raise the money again to then go acquire the company. And then they mm-hmm. try to take it over and do it better themselves, even though they don't know anything about the industry and just do or don't have MBAs. Yeah. So- What's your opinion of the merits of that particular structure? Uh, I think it sounds really silly, but it works extremely well. Really? Yeah. Yeah. The track record for search funds is unbelievable. Uh, You Hmm. can look up some uh, some, uh, studies out there. Stanford's done a number of them. Uh, The asset class uh, over 20 plus years has earned like 30%, over 30%. Um, companies, big companies have come out of it, like Assurian, the folks that give us insurance on our cell phones. Um, it's, yeah, it's incredibly, uh, 
uh, effective. Yeah, there's an interesting book. It sounds up front. One of my past guests uh, on the podcast, Walker Dybel, wrote the book Buy Then Build, and he makes a really compelling argument for why you should skip basically the whole product market fit stage to a business, like building from zero to a million, zero to five million, whatever, and just go to acquiring the company. And when you remove all of the failures that happen in that stage of growth, you actually have a much stable, much more stable, you know, period. And so maybe that has something to do with what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, that our venture capital fund, we only come in after product market fit for those kind of reasons. Yeah, We don't yeah. want to have a bunch of failures that we have to offset by finding the next, you know, TikTok out there to pay for all right. the, the losing investments. Right. So um, did you have a vision for you would go back to your original love because you worked in investment uh, management early in your career, you'd done all those internships we talked about earlier. Is that what you um, envisioned for yourself after Fastspring? I don't know. I don't know what I was envisioning. I think I was focused on Fastspring and doing some angel investing. And that always was a fun thing to do. And then Venture capital, you know, entrepreneurs look up to venture capitalists. So I think I, if I've always been intrigued by it, and it is investment management, which is what my original love was. Although really, I wanted to be a school teacher, but uh, my original love after college, let's say. Uh, and uh, um, I would say uh, I fell into it because, you know, actually, now that I think about it, I did go actually to John Greathouse years ago when he was doing uh, Rincon Venture Partners, which today is Bonfire. And I asked him if he was looking to bring in a, a third partner in their fund. So that must have been about 12 years ago. And he said, you got to get a lot more experience as an angel investor and go through the ups and downs of all that. And I did. Mm. Um, so I did, I guess I did have interest a while back. Um and, and, what, uh, what were the what were the biggest ups and the biggest downs in the early days of those angel investments? Um, well, fortunately for me, almost everything worked out. Uh, there was one that didn't, uh, uh, and that was um, kind of a holistic retail investment, which those are much harder to pull off, and, and I knew that going into it. Um, they had great success in the beginning, and I think it went to their heads. Uh, and so they started spending like that. And uh, when things changed a bit and retailers started acting like retailers, which they're not the greatest partners to have, uh, then uh, they ended up with a whole lot of inventory and going out of business and ran out of cash. Um, so that would be one that didn't work. Um, all the others are still pretty much going. Um, the biggest success was Appeal Sciences, which... Uh, when I invested was uh, I think a four hundred four and a half million dollar valuation, and then it it uh, ran up to two point two billion uh, within wow. something like eight years. Amazing. And fortunately, I was able to sell some uh, at the top, uh, which is great. Yeah, yeah. And actually, that's one thing that you've done as a venture capitalist is you've taken advantage of um, selling in the secondary market. So explain to others what why you would do something like that and how that works. Yeah. So I was saying earlier how there's all these liquidity options that didn't used to exist. So starting actually with Facebook um, came this concept of maybe founders could sell shares into rounds as they go. You weren't able really to do that before. Um, and then um, in other, not just founders, but also other people that own stock, Facebook was really the first situation that led to the secondary market where people like uh, an executive at a company could say, well, I left the company. I've got all these shares. It's illiquid. I have nothing I can do, but wait. Well, all of a sudden that changed and that sprung up a second market um, and shares post. And now there's like 20 different platforms uh, to shell, sell private stock through. Um, but there's other ways to do it as well. It's become such a common thing to be able to buy or sell shares from existing investors, not just from buying stock from the company. Uh, so for example, in our, in our uh, uh, Santa Barbara Venture Partners VC fund, 
in the first fund, we found a few of those opportunities. One of our companies we sold a piece of uh, where we were able to locate an investor that very much wanted to own some of one of the companies. And we had actually 10 conversations, I'd say, with firms like that, that are just in the business of buying secondary shares, meaning shares that are not purchased from the company, but from existing shareholders. Um, and we were able to produce and lock in a really significant profit um, without losing our upside. I mean, we're still holding on to the value majority of the company. But in the meantime, we lock in a gain, we send some distributions back to our investors. And now after just three and a half years of Fund One's existence, we have four uh, exits, uh, three of which involve cash liquidity and distributions. Um, but that's by being creative, combined with in finding liquidity solutions, combined with the fact that there's just a much larger set of options out there for getting liquidity in non-public companies these days than there were five and 10 years ago. Yeah, it really changes the, changes the market. One interesting thing you've done is you've actually um, gone gone well beyond the software world. You're investing, as you said, in food waste and other interesting things. Um, how have you managed to go into different industries um, as a as a venture capitalist? Um, you know, to me on the outside, it seems like you know some people might play it safe and stay just with what they've known so far. Well. You know, food waste for Peel Sciences, that was a personal investment of mine. So was that first holistic company. And there's another one I did that's the leading producer of non-plastic cutlery and trash bags and things like that. Also not really software and traditional tech, but done personally. Everything through the fund is real tech. So it's almost always involving software. It's not always B2B enterprise software. There's a few cases where we invest in companies that have a software application that runs on a phone. Um, but it really is just within that realm. What What is different, different between the companies and where we don't have the expertise always is most of the time, these software companies are in different industries from one another. And there's no way as a software venture capitalist to be an expert in thousands of different industries uh, in order to uh, be able to really master each one that you're investing into. And so the way that we investors deal with that is we bring in or tap experts who know those industries. For example, we invested in a cybersecurity software company. And cybersecurity is one of those areas that you know, it's like healthcare. Either you, you really know it because you've been in it and you get it, or you don't. And if you don't, watch out. Uh, so, in a case like that, in order for us to gain comfort, we had to go through a real process to educate ourselves, but also to partner with those who knew cybersecurity really well. So, we brought in a couple firms and they ended up participating in the round. In fact, one of them led it. Uh, that are experts specifically in cybersecurity software investments in companies. Uh, one of them, all they do is cybersecurity software. It's called Blue Ventures on the, in the Southeast. Um, and so that's how one, an example of how one can deal with, you know, one's weakness in terms of uh, not being expert in every industry that one invests into. What about um, the, the flips? So it's kind of an interesting mod business model, being a venture capitalist, because you have to find the investments but you also are managing on the other side investors. And was it a challenge for you switching to, you know, gathering up a bunch of limited partners to invest in, you know, you as kind of a first time venture capitalist? It's definitely a challenge. You know, when I did it the first time, it was 2020 and a lot of people were kind of sitting around with money, to be frank. They yeah. were bored. Uh, they had made a whole lot in tech. It was a period when, no, oh, you can't lose. That's what it was like. Crypto had gone crazy. People were into all sorts of things like mm -hmm. metaverse and you know what, what are those things? Silly things. Uh, NFTs. Tokenization. Or, no, yeah. what it was called? The, Coins. the NFTs. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you NFTs. Know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would be not hearing much about NFT, NFTs now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Funny yeah. how that works. Um, but uh so it was a good, really special time to be investing. I didn't know if that would be the case. I thought maybe it would be a horrible time. And people were in the middle of the pandemic. People were pretty freaked out. And unemployment had gotten to 20-something percent from, I don't know, 5% in just a couple of months. And I don't have to remind us of all the problems. Uh, but it was a scary time. Um, and uh, it continued to be really a great uh, investing climate um, and relatively easy to raise for the fund. Um, until the market shifted and then it became incredibly difficult and you know nothing really changed in what we're offering or me 
or our team, it only got more compelling, but the environment became less and less compelling. I mean, not in reality, because actually prices go down and that's when you want to buy. But in terms of people's, you know, the sentiment and the last thing for quite a while that investors were looking to do is put more money into a um, illiquid uh, technology venture capital fund, uh, given what they had just been experiencing with the shifts in the market. So it went from pretty good, pretty easy to extremely difficult. And to give you a sense, like an actual, uh, some, some data, uh, emerging managers, which means venture capitalists who have funds that are on their first fund or second fund, and maybe even their third fund, but not later stage, that asset class um, went from two or three year period of about 70, 75 billion in assets coming in from new investment to about 35 billion to last year about four or five billion so 70 something to about Big five yeah. what a decreased pool of money yeah. available to uh, a vc fund uh so you can imagine what that experience has been like uh, for venture capitalists who are not you know sequoia who are not on their fifth or sixth or seventh fund who are not big brand names so um that's how dramatically the market changed over that yeah. time period. You still like it though? Are you still passionate about it? Still interested in pursuing it though? Oh, absolutely. I'm just yeah. saying that, uh, you know, it was easy to raise money from outside investors. Relatively speaking, it came in, became incredibly hard and now it's getting less hard. Yeah. For us, it's getting easier and easier because we've had so many liquidity events and so many yeah. successful exits. So we stand out very much relative to most other VC funds. Um, especially during this era, this period of time in tech. But uh, no, we absolutely uh, love it even more from an investment perspective because prices have dropped so much. We can get such better deals than we could before and they will recover. They already have been, right? I mean, look yeah. in the public market look, of Facebook. Look at the market, yeah. Media, yeah. Look at NASDAQ broke new records again. So yeah. uh, it's already started recovering. Um, and so we'll benefit from that ongoing recovery. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we've been able to pay multiples in deals that are just would have been unheard of in the past. It really, you know, the problem is that when prices drop, assuming it's a sound industry, which the United States technology industry is, um, uh, it will always continuously innovate. Uh, it doesn't mean it won't have ups and downs along the way and people won't overreact in the positive and the negative along the way, but, um, uh, it's when prices go down, that's the time to be investing. But that's also the time that most uh, investors run away. Yeah, They run away screaming. Yeah. Um, we're supposed to be buying low and selling high and being able to follow that basic premise. But unfortunately, prices drop and everybody runs. So that's why you know one has professional ma money, ma money and investment managers to help them deal with, you know, their Emotion, uh, inner emotions. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the yeah because if it. you're going to be a successful long-term investor, just like Warren Buffett will tell you over and over again, you can't let your emotions drive things. Right. Um, right. You got to understand why you're feeling the way you are and act in the rational and long-term investment way. And um, you, that's not I, easy to do. And you, um, you want to highlight some of those um, exits that you've had? Jack Pocket, I think is the most recent one. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Jack Pocket is the leading app for buying lottery tickets through mobile. There's really no other way to avoid going to a physical store to buy your lottery tickets. And lottery industry is $400 billion industry. It's bigger than all casinos in the world combined. Uh, wow. So it's a wonderful space to be the leader in. Uh, and so we invested in Jack Pocket and uh, they got acquired or they announced getting acquired uh, about two and a half weeks ago for $750 million by um, uh, Oops. DraftKings. DraftKings. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Just drew a blank. Thinking of FanDuel. Yeah. Uh, you know, by DraftKings. And so that's a wonderful success story. We're really excited for them. And uh, obviously, we and the other investors have done really, really well. We didn't expect uh, such a successful exit so soon. Uh, we only invested about two and a half years ago. Um, but that's that's a, that's a great outcome. And you know, there's only so many billion dollar or near billion dollar exits out there. And uh, we're fortunate to have one of them. And also wonderful for Santa Barbara to have yet another exit like that. And now we'll have DraftKings in town, another wonderful company, and uh, help us expand our, our Santa Barbara ecosystem even further. Yeah. Dan, this has been so interesting. Thank you for um, sharing all your lessons and your stories and everything. And I love to close by asking people about um, 
who they would want to shout out and acknowledge and and recognize for helping them in their journey, especially peers, contemporaries, co-founders, limited partners in your funds. Who would you want to mention and and thank? Uh, well, certainly my partner Dan Hedden has been a major force in our success in our two funds for Santa Barbara Venture Partners, um, and. I would say in terms of, the, you know, learning about venture capital over the years, uh, probably John Greathouse, um, who was part of Rincon and then Bonfire. Now he's doing, uh, he's chair of a bunch of different boards here locally for software and tech companies. Um, he's been a mentor to me. And the other one has been Mitchell Green from Lead Edge Capital, who has just hit the cover off the ball for the past 20 years and now runs, uh, I think, $6 billion dollars down the street here in Santa Barbara as a really successful later stage uh, software uh, VC fund that we we try to emulate if we can. Uh, um, so I would say them and then certainly my father on the, on the business side and finance and entrepreneurship. Um, um, but uh, so those are some of the folks that, that come to mind for me as having the most impact. Dan, this is great. Where can people go to learn more about you or learn more about Santa Barbara Venture Partners? It's just Santa Barbara VP, like venturepartners.com. Santa Barbara VP.com is, is our website. So uh, thanks so much for, for the time and having an interest. Excellent. Thanks so much, Dan. All right. Thanks for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.